Well, good morning and uh, thank you for uh, joining this uh, call on uh, strategic autonomy and the uh, in the future um, with reference to the car industry. I'm David Henning from eSight, but I'm handing over now to uh, Barbara Mowens from uh, Politico, who's going to moderate this uh, this session. Which uh, we will we will start as ever slowly as people uh, continue to join inevitably over the next couple of minutes. Over to you, Barbara. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Uh, like David said, I'm Politico's senior trade correspondent and very um, enthusiastic to welcome you to this event um, as people are, all, are still joining us this morning. Um, today, we're going to discuss the future of this key export sector for the EU, the car industry, and more in general, EU trade policy, which is even more um, changing very rapidly these last few weeks um, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So a lot to discuss um, this morning. And again, I, I welcome you those who have just joined. Um, I will quickly introduce today's speakers and then hand the floor to each of them to give some introductory remarks before we get to our uh, discussion. Uh, first, we have David Hennig, who um, He's the director of the UK Trade Policy Project at the European Centre for International Political Economy. He'll dive into his recent paper um, on the future of the EU leadership in the car industry. Uh, next, we have Patrick Keating from Honda. Welcome to you as well, um, who will give a bit more perspective from the inside on the future of the car industry, the transformations of this sector. And then I look forward to hearing from Pasi, who is the director of the Trade Policy Unit at the Foreign Affairs Department of Finland. Good morning to you too. Um, he will give his perspective on the developments of the EU's trade policy and how, how the war in Ukraine might shift those developments. So first, I'm very happy to pass the floor back to David um, for some introductory remarks on his paper on the future of the car industry and how that paper or the content of that paper may have all changed uh, given recent events in these last few weeks. Back to you, David. And we... <laughs> Afraid if David if has some trouble, then we'll just skip to Patrick first, if that's okay for you, Patrick, and then get back to David after. Um, um, so obviously, uh, Patrick, some insights from the, the inside of the car industry on this subject, as if you can. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Barbara. And thanks for um, SCP for, for hosting this event, which I think is coming at a really timely, timely moment in terms of trade, but also the transition of the industry. And I think the key thing to understand here is that um, the automotive industry globally is undergoing an unprecedented level of change. We are seeing changes in a, in a matter of months and years um, that, that rival what happened in the last century. Um, we're seeing changes in terms of the technology of, of powertrains, in terms of electrification, but also the role of data, AI, connectivity, and indeed new models of ownership and, and, and use of, of, of cars and mobility. And this is a huge change for, for companies that are, that are operating in this space. So if you look at Honda, um, for whom I work, we're moving from being the world's largest manufacturer of internal combustion engines currently to being fully net zero across all of our business operations globally by, by 2050. So that gives you some idea of the huge scale of, of change. These changes are being driven by, by a range of factors. Um, I think primarily there's the obvious need to, to respond to, to the climate emergency, but equally we're seeing um, increasingly stringent regulation across the globe and, and Europe's very much leading in that space in terms of environmental regulation, but also safety and, and performance standards. But we're also seeing changing consumer behavior um, globally. People are wanting to use mobility in a different way. They're wanting to buy things in a different way. And they're more thinking, more thoughtful about the products that they do choose to buy and use. But then we're also seeing the entrance of disruptors into the marketplace. So the traditional um, automotive manufacturers with the legacy of ICE, um, are having to compete against new entrants that don't necessarily have, have that baggage. And there we see some, well, obviously Tesla is a main, main name there, but also a number of EV manufacturers coming from other regions of the world, such as China. And I think in terms of this discussion, the key point is, is the scale and the pace of this change is such that no one actor can, can face it alone. Um, and that's why we're seeing um, companies choosing to work together. So recently, Honda and Sony announced that they would be developing a member of an of understanding to share their expertise and to develop new electric vehicles and services. 
creating synergies between Honda's car manufacturing capacity and know-how and Sony's expertise in the area of data, data services and, and, and online technology. Um, we're seeing similar partnerships announced um, all across the industry as, as, as people are attempting to, to manage this huge change in a way that's effective and, and efficient. But the same is, is, is true of countries and, and, and markets. And again, the reality is that no one country or region can, can win this transition. It's not a zero sum game. Um, so we do hear some politicians speaking about seeking to be world leading in terms of EV manufacturing or to, or to be the global first. But really what we need to be doing, and, and this is what Honda is doing, is leveraging global supply chains, global know-how, global manufacturing capacity. Um, there are opportunities for Europe in this space um, to, to, to develop these technologies, to develop manufacturing in this space, but an approach that's based on, on protectionism or throwing up boundaries really isn't, isn't going to work in our, our point of view. And key to that is, and key to the whole transition really, is making sure the consumer and the customer is at the center of this, this journey. And we need to ensure that um, there's a, a dynamic and, and um, exciting market within Europe and also globally to ensure that consumers here in Europe have a range of affordable mobility options to ensure that no one's priced out of, of, of transport. So while we see government investments in, in um, manufacturing of, of zero emissions vehicles in, in the UK and Europe, we see a lot of investments into battery manufacturing. That's all really important to help European manufacturers, to help European employees and supply chains. But an approach purely based on that domestic champion approach um, won't, won't succeed. Because as we've seen from, from the piece of work that SEP have led, but also from, from our broader knowledge of, of trade and economics, putting up boundaries really reduces consumer choice and will increase, increase pricing. So for, for European industrial policy, climate policy, FIT 55, to succeed for that transition to occur at the pace we need. We need an open and, and fair tra trade policy that ensures consumers can access zero emissions vehicles um, and indeed manufacturers can access supplies, components, and batteries from a wide range of sources, ensuring that we can do this in the most efficient um, and affordable way. Obviously the recent um, issues around the supply chain crisis, geopolitical issues, Shows, shows why the EU is taking an approach of strategic autonomy and seeking to stand at its own two feet, and particularly when it comes to EV manufacturing. But that approach can't be taken in isolation. It needs to be coupled with an open trade policy to ensure that everyone can access um, clean and efficient vehicles, but equally that we see a market for those vehicles in, in other countries. And as the piece from SCP shows that um, putting up boundaries in, in our region could lead to others putting up boundaries in their region and bring the whole project to a halt rather than racing for the finish line. So thanks for um, the opportunity to say a few words and, and looking forward to taking questions later. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. That's exactly the, the issues that we're going to raise today. So thanks for your contribution. I'm happy to see that, that David is back. Um, Patrick stepped in for a second, but happy to give the floor back to you now, David, if it's all working. Well, Barbara, thank you. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. I've had to go into my very much my backup system as uh, Zoom inconveniently crashed the very moment uh, after the, uh, the call started on my computer and has not come back despite repeated efforts. So uh, we're on the phone. Uh, it works reasonably well. So <laughs> sorry about that, everybody. Strategic autonomy in the car industry, where now? And the reason for that where now, we might have had a better idea where now three months ago when we published the report looking at the all important car sector in the light of what we then thought were the major challenges of the day, the climate transformation and strategic autonomy. And, and those still are, but that seems a different world. Um, we're now in the in a, in a post invasion world. What changes? So, you know, I, I hope we can we can think today about what what changes in that. I think it still remains the case. One of the things our headline point was global leadership that the EU has had in the car sector requires global presence and um, policies have to be calibrated accordingly. Anyway, I want to make five points about about this, which will hopefully lead into the discussion later. The first the EU and particularly the car industry benefits from trade. Now, the narrative is the EU has been losing out on, on trade, but actually the EU consistently produces more cars than it sells. China produces more than the EU, but China produces less than it's been selling. 
uh, that those figures came out the, came out of the of our study. The EU market is not particularly growing for cars, and yet choice continues to be wide because of the global nature of the market. Um, and there's extensive production globally. And, and perhaps most important of all, some, for the last 10 years, between 50 and 200 percent of the EU trade surplus in goods has been within the automotive sector. So this is hugely important. Um, so that's the first point. Second point, this is a transformational time. The climate emergency does require a fundamental change in technology ac across, across the economy. Vehicles are already computed on wheels. Electric vehicles require less parts. There's going to be a change to supply chains across Europe. Um, I'm starting to wonder, in the light of recent events, whether we're going to see a reverse of the 1990s talk for peace dividend in which we were going to move military production into domestic manufacturing, whether we're now going to see the opposite happening, which is was not on anybody's list of predictions for 2022. Um, and predominant thinking is changing from open markets towards government intervention. Um, that's that's a trend we've seen for some years. We're seeing competitive subsidies between major markets for battery production, semiconductors, a rush to identify what is critical infrastructure and ensure that we know where that's produced. And I was speaking to a business uh, last week who said they've never known more interest from government in where they're sourcing all their supply chains. Clearly, there's a ch there's a change of foot, um, and I don't think we can we can deny that. On the other hand, globalization is not over. I think it's just changing. That's point number three. Notwithstanding the the, ch the change to, to uh, the thinking about resilience, globalization was in as much as anything else about technology developments allowing companies to source goods and services. Uh, from anywhere in the world. And, and those opportunities still remain. Large companies are very much integrators, considering numerous factors in how they thought, including price, value, quality, their home market, political risk. And I, I would see that continuing. I don't see why that is going to change um, right, right now. Um, so, um, and, and domestic pressures have made trade the sort of so something bad. Governments have taken the lesson of COVID. They need to intervene in, in, in supply chains. And there's a kind of corporatist interplay of business and government looking at the, the, the economy as a whole and, and regulation is in there as well. We also see consumers having power. The consumer demands over um, companies withdrawing from Russia made a difference as well as the, the political side. And that plays towards the EU's values agenda and the sustainability one. So this is very much not, we have, it's very much not the, the case that we're saying um, in, 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 in the report, oh no to a values agenda, let's just have free markets running, running around. It's quite clear there is a, a new globalization, there is a values agenda, there's sustainability. So the question is how do we then um, balance all of that? And I think one of the big things I wanted to do with the, with the report was to consider all the open strategic autonomy and Green Deal initiatives as a collective. And when doing so, what does the collective tell us? It tells us of quite a defensive um, mindset that carbon border adjustment mechanism, investment screening, deforestation, due diligence, anti-coercion, international procurement. They're all seeking to protect the EU market or values from others. None of them are about um, openness or partnership. Now, there are partnership initiatives. Uh, you know, there are free trade agreements still there, but they're kind of a second priority. There's the Trade and Technology Council with the US, which I think is turning into an interesting initi initiative, which might be something to uh, to to build on. But it, there's no doubt the overall thrust is to, towards a sort of protective, uh, protective, if not protectionist mindset. Um, Patrick had mentioned, <laughs> I finally managed to connect, um, ab about the, uh, the risk of retaliatory measures. I would I would say a lot depends on implementation. And one of the interesting things with these measures is that um, as initially defined, it's not clear how anti-coercion perhaps or uh, international procurement will definitely be implemented, whether and actually they're more about deterrence and whether you can turn them to be more about 
partnership. And I think that's a big question to come is is going to be the uh, the implementation. I'm quite interested as well to see what uh, how the team in DG Trade will change around those kind of initiatives. How much will, for example, that be more like what we've seen before with anti anti dumping? So part of presumably the enforcement uh, function now. Um, but I think the final point, I think this is what I take particularly from uh, recent events, is that we need to make sure our trade policy is just as concerned with our partners as those who may seek to, to harm us. And the collective response to Russia's invasion, I think, should remind us of the need for alliance and partnerships, which we haven't really seen enough of. Um, and I just wonder, have our initiatives been too much about China and making us too defensive and not enough? about frankly the rest of the rest of the world who are our, our allies and friends for for the eu how are we going to work on them china's the big issue we're going to have to return to that. i i i didn't have time to sort of in in this opening uh in, intervention to really go through china but that's a huge issue with decoupling which i have a nasty sense that china you're going to ask me difficult questions about barbara uh to to, to come but and i think as well the wto is uh, vital as a global institution i think in, in that the eu's role is to try to remind the us of that and that we can't afford now even more so to be seen as a closed protectionist system we're now in a much more obvious battle against uh aut autocratic rulers and we need something that um you know you can aspire to a values agenda a trade agenda an openness agenda and i don't think we've quite got that um right it doesn't mean the measures in themselves are necessarily wrong but it means i think that we need to make them more about how they will be used with partners and how they will be used collectively rather than how it is the EU alone that has to enforce all of this. So that's uh, that brings my opening intervention to a close. I'll back to you, Barbara. Thank you. Thanks, David. A lot of subjects, a lot of um, issues that I'd like to jump on for questions and for discussion. But first, let me um, introduce Basi as well and give him the floor for some introductory remarks on um, an EU government perspective on, on all of these subjects. Thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, thank you very much uh, for having me uh, on the show. Uh, and it's been a very uh, thought provoking uh, um, presentations by Patrick and David both. Uh, on on uh, trade policy as such, I mean, the EU trade strategy uh, from February 2021 uh, that was called open, sustainable and assertive trade policy was framed by a world of uncertainty, weakness of international institutions and the rule system, uh, unilateral trade measures, rising economic nationalism and protectionism. And, and there you have had the pandemic and, and, and trade wars that were forcing us to think about uh, supply chain uh, vulnerabilities and critical dependencies and get rid of them. And, and then you had the overarching uh, theme of climate change, uh, the limits of our planetary resources and, and sustainable development goals uh, that were demanding a more um, sustainable and responsible international commerce. Um, so um, in that framework, the trade strategy didn't see uh, a land war in Europe uh, or its regional or international implications. So uh, that's uh, that has sort of changed the picture a bit. However, the big picture uh, has changed very little. Uh, I mean, institutions remain weak. Uh, economic nationalism and protectionism are still very much in the books. And Russia's war may reinforce such tendencies in Europe as well. Uh, and so I would presume that uh, supply chain resilience, for instance, and, and restructuring is going to get gain more impetus. And it's it's likely that the philosophy of strategic autonomy that Patrick mentioned will gain more strength because of the war. Now, uh, given the EU's importance and clout in world trade, uh, strategic autonomy, if it means a sort of an ability to, of the EU to make decisions and act independently from others, it certainly makes sense. I mean, we are a big uh, player in international trade, so uh, you have to be able to be autonomous as well from time to time. If it becomes a gospel for economic policy, there are evident risks. There's a great paper uh, by the ESI uh, from last year uh, 
that was uh, written for uh, in view of the pandemic, it shows that there's really a small amount of products uh, that the EU is dependent on uh, um, from sourcing outside of the EU, and none of them was vital in, in the treatment of COVID-19. In the case of a symmetrical shock, uh, there's no amount of domestic production that could shelter us from that sort of impact. And um, it's, it's obvious, uh, in my opinion, that, uh, that firms are rethinking as of now, uh, just on time supply chains, uh, efficiencies with the uh, just in case ingredients. And that's gonna become prob probably more pronounced now in view of the war. Uh, and that is just fine for me, as long as private firms do that on their own initiative, uh, because they are the most knowledgeable of their supply chains. And once states, start to interfere in supply chain planning or organizing, I think the risks amount. Apart from energy and some raw materials, Russia has not been a major source of critical dependencies or vulnerabilities. I mean, in fact, the commission study last year indicated that Russia dependency was, but in just one uh, raw material, platinum. Uh, but ap apart from that, there are materials such as palladium, nickel and aluminium where the imports have been impacted and will be impacted by the war and we are for instance in, the, in Finland experiencing shortages of urea even if that is not a commodity that is normally in short supply. Uh, it, in, in terms of Russia I think these sort of dependencies are likely to be minimized in the future uh, and if, if I mean even when the conditions return to normal uh, in, in the relations between us and the Russians, it's, it's probably likely that there are, will be few actors that want to increase their dependency on Russia uh, further. Now, the um, open and sustainable and assertive trade policy paper was rather thin on trade agreements, as, as, as David <coughs> pointed out himself as well. And Russia is not a very important trading partner for the EU as such, it's more uh, important vice versa. But the practical closing of that market will mean that there will be alternative markets and suppliers that will have to be found. In, in a positive context, this could be reflected in, a, in closer and more coherent cooperation with like-minded countries. And I'm thinking of especially the United States that uh, David alluded to as well. And, and trade agreements with the rest of the world may again start appealing to those have, who have been delaying them uh, for domestic political reasons um, in the past. But in that positive case, I mean, if we're gonna see that, uh, the EU must find the right balance between trade and economic interests, whether in terms of further ma market opening or supply chain uh, resilience building and the sustainable development and the value-based demands that we place on our trading partners. Um, there is some uh, rhetoric also to game, uh, get rid of uh, energy uh, dependencies, but this will take time and will also require major investment uh, in renewable, renewable energy in Europe. And in the meantime, it may also uh, uh, mean an increase in the use of fossil fuel uh, energies and perhaps some renaissance of uh, nuclear energy, even if the latter is also linked to uh, strategic dependencies. What this means to trade policy is not entirely clear. Um, and and um, there, uh, for instance, I mean, the trade policy was supposed to be assertive, right? The idea was to use uh, trade policy as a tool and it might be gaining strength. And in this sort of uncertainty, the EU needs autonomous instruments. That would be the saying, right? And, and it's difficult to argue against it in the current context. Uh, um, but could we see some uh, rethinking of trade defense instruments? Uh, because I mean, China, for instance, is a major producer of renewable energy production technology. Uh, but China is, uh, uh, the Chinese solar panels are a major uh, subject to various trade defense measures. Now, ideally, that's uh, the sig significance uh, of import protection in such a situation should be reassessed also taking into account uh, more the interests of end users. Would we be willing to look at other products under defense measures to boost our imports? Might be worth considering, given the exceptional circumstances. At any rate, uh, the economic premise of trade instruments remains the same, regardless of the war. And I think Patrick and David both uh, pointed to that. I mean, 
instruments may be useful for assertive trade policy, but they can also lead to an increase in border protection, effectively closing the EU market, reduction in competition, increases in costs, and dampening of any uh, possible recovery. This will also affect our ability to compete in the, in, in the external markets as well, because there's this learner symmetry theory from the 1930s that is still very valid uh, even today. I mean, the more borders we put up, the more uh, impact that will have also in our external uh, market uh, aspirations. Finally, I think uh, as, as David was talking about the uh, uh, internal, international uh, trading system uh, and how the uh, WTO uh, would be uh, in need of reform, uh, I'm just wondering whether it's possible in the current situation. Um, it's lethargic uh, uh, state um, is likely to comp continue at, at the most positive, I think the, uh, the crisis in international relations may be a catalyst for new unity, um, like we had in uh, 20, uh, 2001 when, with the uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11. Um, but such effects uh, have proved depressingly short-lived in the past. And I think the difficulty uh, at the moment in comparison to the uh, terrorist attacks of 2001 is of course that the membership in the WTO is not united in its support of the US like we were then, uh, but we are rather divided in our condemnation of Russia uh, today. So hence, it's difficult to see the WTO members uh, joining forces in favor of the trading system, the WTO reform and the trade negotiations. Now, if the ministerial conference will be held in June, uh, and, and it's, it's a big if, um, um, it would be important that we would be able to advance the EU goals on, on WTO reform, uh, including the restoration of the uh, dispute settlement, because in the long run, it's difficult to see that the system of, of rules could be left undeveloped. Um, and as David said, it's very important that we uh, have the commitment of the United States uh, uh, to the WTO and the rules in general, because um, um, uh, I mean, if, if the US will not abide by the WTO rules, uh, then what's the, uh, what, is, what is there for China to abide by the rules either? Um, does the EU need a new trade strategy? Uh, I mean, after all, the, uh, the last one is barely one year old. I, I think not necessarily, uh, as long as we uh, remember the, op uh, the first part of the uh, trade policy, I mean, open, uh, uh, trade policy. Uh, I think given the war in Ukraine, the EU must be uh, doubly open to trade and investment if our economic resilience is uh, to be strengthened. And it means an active trade policy around the world. It means also that trade agreements must be completed and enter into force. And the level of uh, ambition must be proportionate to the volume of, of exchange. And I'm afraid that an inward turning border erecting EU would be exacerbated in its already difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, obviously, a lot of a lot of subjects to feels like almost uh, or at least a large part of, of EU policy is obviously being re-examined in the light of this war. So in that sense, it's not an easy time to hold a webinar on, on EU trade policy, but it is a very interesting time to do so. Um, before we jump into the discussion, can I please encourage everyone who wants to, and I see some have already done so, um, who wants to ask questions to do so in the chat, and then I'll take a look and pop some of those um, into the discussion. Um, maybe let me start with um, one of the issues that you've all raised, but uh, maybe we can go into it a little bit more deeper. Um, the, the reinforcement of calls for strategic autonomy. Um, some um, obviously say that this crisis only proves that the EU needs to be more autonomous, um, both on the economic front, also on the military front, and others on the energy front. Um, others, for example, the EU trade chief, Valdis Zembrowski, say, no, we need more openness, more trade partners um, to, to reply to this crisis. Um, I see you've gone into this a little bit, so I'd like to maybe shift to um, more towards David first. Um, you argued in, in your recent blog post that um, 
David, that economics always points to openness in trade, right? Um, can you elaborate a bit and how do you see this discussion within the EU going forward in the next few months? Do we need a new trade policy, uh, like Passy said? Thank you. And Passy, I think that was a really interesting intervention. I don't think, I think I was leaning against a new trade policy because I think that that's actually uh, too, 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 much, too much effort when, you know, the building blocks are all there. It's a matter, I think, of how they're used. So, I, and I think in the paper, we don't necessarily say, no, you shouldn't put forward any of these measures. There are good, strong reasons to put forward anti-coercion. I mean, international procurement was an argument for so, has been in a discussion around the EU for so long that even I attended a meeting uh, in, in, uh, in, in Brussels as a UK government representative on the international procurement instrument in 2016. Um, so there are good reasons to have those instruments, just like there are good reasons to have the free trade agreement discussions and the um, uh, trade and technology council and the other narratives. I mean, even, even uh, sorry, the other dialogues. We're even having a dialogue. There's an EU-China dialogue next next week. Um, so there's good reasons that all of these things are in place. What I don't think, what I, what I have been frustrated by, is that they've not been discussed in the round. Right? How do we make them all work collectively? Um, these 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 different initiatives. What does it tell? What does it tell us? How are we going to make sure that? in operating the anti-coercion and various others, that we actually get a, um, a, 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 a the right kind of balance between, I don't think I have a problem with the EU having the power to act as an autonomous actor. I'd act, argue that it already had lots of the power anyway. So, ha but how do we balance that power? How do we use that power? One of the issues with using uh, the, the power, even of the instruments is, do you actually dare to even use them um, one of the problems in the past with the EU taking initiatives has not been that it didn't have the power, but it didn't want to politically. It was sensitive for one member state or other or many. So how does the EU use the, the initiatives? How does it, be, how does it be, be, become, uh, you know, how does it balance all of this? And I think my initial feeling over the last three weeks is that what needs that, that it needs to be thinking more about now uh, the, the broader alliances. Um, that we have lots of the power that can be taken against China. We need to be seriously thinking about what might happen with China, but also how do we build those 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 friendships? Some you know that that alliance that includes Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, South South Korea. Do we look again at at South America at Mercosur? I think those are the sort of questions, and 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 how are we going to uh, to use it that should be going alongside the the passing of the uh, of of the measures like the anti coercion instrument. I think that that would be my take, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Patrick, what's your perspective? I mean, from from the from the car industry, um, we have all these calls for more strategic autonomy. You've touched upon it a little bit, but how do you see this debate moving forward within the EU, and what's your take on it? You're I'm off, come off mute there. Uh, I think after two years doing this, I'd have uh, learned by now. Um, I, I think from from the industry, you sort of where David was coming from was was quite high level and, and theoretical and at sort of the the macro political level. But I think from us where we have to deal with this operationally on a day to day basis and thinking about what impacts our our customers, we we support uh, an approach that is much more open that recognises the global nature of the industry. Um, and uh, it's an industry that does have to respond to, to geopolitical trends. So we've seen with, with the, the war in Ukraine and, and increasing pressure on China, that the industry responds and looks to adapt its supply chain. So we'd look to a policy framework that, that supports that. So I think building on what David was saying, looking at extending those, that network of trade deals with, with other regions, with other countries, looking to, to find ways to support the industry and in diversifying its its supply chains, not necessarily away from China specifically, but just diversification in general. We've seen with the semiconductor issue that an over-reliance on one particular source of semiconductors, um, I think David might be typing, so there's a bit of a... Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, um, creates, creates problems. So that, that's where we'd be looking for, for policymakers to, to take action, is to, to develop that, that global network of open, free and fair um, trade regimes and making sure that the, the I saw one of the questions in in the chat around um, 
regulation and regulatory barriers, often those are the bigger barriers to trade than necessarily tariffs or, or, or some of the issues that are dealt with in trade agreements. So definitely a big piece of work for the EU to be taking forward in, in taking a lead, in fact, on, on setting global and international standards to help further develop that, 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 that open trade network. But coming back to the strategic autonomy point, as I was saying in, in my opening remarks, that's not necessarily um, a, a negative thing. There is definitely a role for, for, for government and, and the institutions to play in developing a strong and vibrant European manufacturing sector and European market. But that needs to be done hand in hand with, with an open trade policy. Um, I, don't, I don't see the two things necessarily as being in, in, in contradiction, but one without the other won't, won't necessarily work. Um, of course, uh, we, I, I'm representing the views of, of, of one manufacturer that's more of an importer than an exporter at this point. There may be others in, in uh, more export focused companies in Europe who would have a different view. Yeah, thanks. I mean, like you said, I mean, it's always kind of strategic autonomy or open strategic autonomy, we call it, you know, it's not if, if it's both openness and um, for the EU to do more on its own. I mean, Hasek had a question in the chat, like, what if we call it strategic? openness would it you know would that is it just a marketing issue or is it more a policy problem um Basi, i just i wanted to throw this this back at you i mean we've always had this we've had this discussion since we had a new a new trade policy right should, it should be open at the same time we should have more um we should focus more on strategic autonomy not be protectionist but still um is, do you think that is, this debate will just continue or will we really see reinforcement of this call for strategic autonomy um, in, in the next months? And is that something that you are afraid of as a more, you know, more liberal, free trading um, country? Um, well, yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, if I'm more afraid of um, um, closing um, down than uh, opening up. Um, uh, it's um, it, trade policy wise for sure. I, I think we would be uh, doing ourselves a disservice if we were to um, um, close down um, the market, um, and and that's it. That is an inherent risk of the um, of the instrumentalization of trade policy that we are currently um, uh, looking into, uh, um, and I think. Um, on the other hand, um, even um, I mean, it's it's somewhat understandable that we are going to have this uh, debate about, um, and, and it's going to gain more strength now because of the war uh, about in in what fields we should try to have additional um, or autonomy, um, whether in terms of production or um, sourcing or. Um, or that sort of thing, but I mean there are uh, various ways of doing these things, I mean, and I, I, I believe that we are we would be more uh, autonomous uh, by being uh, as as David uh, alluded to uh, more open at the same time and and more diversified, because uh, um, I mean let's on on for instance on on microchips. Um, um, it this wasn't a problem really. Uh, two years ago that we were dependent on, on sourcing from a few countries in in in, uh, in asia uh, but it has become a sort of a problem now because of um, um, the pandemic having and the, uh, to some extent the trade war also having impacted on the uh, uh, sourcing of uh, chips and, and then th there has been the uh, uh, the uh, the fact that we have uh, chips but they are wrong size for the auto industry for instance and all that sort of thing so um, i mean um, there are uh, there are uh, risks that we uh, will start um, um, uh, thinking about these things in the wrong way. So I, I think in that regard, it's clearly uh, uh, something to be mindful of um, in, in 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 the months to come. Um, that um, uh, that we need a dose of strategic autonomy, uh, but it has to be moderated by uh, by sensible. Uh, actions uh, also in trade policy thank you um maybe moving forward um david talked already a little bit about what does this mean for for our relationship with china we have the eu china summit coming up um april 1st um we have we ha already had a lot of discussions especially in germany on on decoupling from from russia which the, the EU is now starting to do with the sanctions. 
what does this mean um, or what should this mean for our relationship with China? Um, we also had an interesting question in the chat that China obviously holds a large share of critical raw materials that are needed to produce electric vehicles. Um, is there a risk that access to these materials will be hindered because of the geopolitical tensions at this moment, um, given, given the war with Russia? Uh, maybe Patrick, let me first hand to you on this, on this very specific question, but also just more general on what does this war in Russia mean, should mean for EU-China relations, trade relations, thanks. Thanks, yeah. Um... China, China is a really important market for, for Honda from a global perspective. So it's, it's one of our top three global regional markets in terms of sales and, and manufacturing. So we're manufacturing millions of vehicles in China for both the domestic market, um, but also for, for other regions of the world. So it is, it is key to us. I think also in terms of battery sourcing, um, China is still uh, several orders of magnitude ahead of other global regions in terms of of battery production. So it does have a key role to play in ensuring the success of the transition towards um, electrified vehicles in terms of, of the volume and the scale of, of production of vehicles, but as well as, 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 as raw materials. But you're right to say there are some emerging risks um, coming out of the geopolitical situation, whether that's potential secondary sanctions stemming from, from sanctions on Russia. So it could be that um, Russian goods that flow through China are then subject to sanctions coming into into Europe or other global regions. That's an area of, of, of risk that we're continuing to um, monitor. Equally, we see if, if China does start to take a, a stronger role in terms of supporting the Russian uh, side in, in the war in Ukraine, that could indeed lead to further risks of sanctions and, and as an area we're continuing to monitor. But I think from, from a, a Honda point of view, we, we wouldn't necessarily take a view on, on, on the politics of it. We would say we are definitely aware that that's an area of, of, of risk and something that we would continue to monitor and shows why you need um, a diverse set of supply chains because uh, we live in an increasingly volatile, uncertain and complex world where simple reliance on, on one sourcing strategy is, 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 is far too, too risky. In, in terms of the, the broader impact on the industry on, of, of, of the, uh, the war in Ukraine, obviously that's had a pretty dramatic impact um, across, across the board. Um, Obviously, putting aside the the, the, the human cost, which it, which is tragic and awful, and, and indeed Honda has has um, donated money to support some charitable activities in in the Ukraine uh, and to support our, our, our workforce there. But what we do see is is the Ukraine was a source of of quite specific um, componentry, so wiring harnesses, certain types of wiring, uh, as well as certain minerals. That's obviously had a, an impact on on manufacturing downstream in. In, in Western Europe, obviously any production in, in the Ukraine has, has come to an end. But equally, we've seen um, other, other competitors who do have a manufacturing presence in Russia that, that indeed has, has, has come to a stop due to the impact of, of the sanctions, but as well as choices by companies to, to stop doing business in, in, in Russia. So the impact on the industry has been quite, quite significant. And I think that comes on top of, of, of you know, the, the previous crises we've yeah. had related to, to Corona, to the semiconductor shortages. Um, and to, to previous disruptions to world trade. So yeah, it's yeah. certainly a challenging time for the industry um, in terms of the geopolitics of it all. Yeah, of course. And uh, obviously it makes sense that you don't want to get into the, the what should the, the EU do toward China. So I'll, I'll redirect that question to, to Passi for um, the more government perspective. How, will this, how do you think this will change EU-China trade relations? Um, that's pretty tough. Um, I would say, uh, well, I, I think as, as, um, as Patrick was saying, I think quite a lot will depend uh, in, in, the, uh, in the coming months anyway, uh, about where, uh, what sort of stance uh, does uh, China take in, in the war uh, in Ukraine? Because uh, obviously if, if it, uh, the, the support um, for a Russian war aims becomes too pronounced uh, or more pronounced than it is today. Uh, I think it will be hard for the uh, um, uh, those countries that have been uh, supporting of the uh, Ukrainian defense um, against the aggression. Uh, it will be uh, really hard to um, see that it would not have an impact on our relations with China. I think it's... Uh, it's a topic anyway of, uh, of another other seminar as to, uh, because um, what I was thinking of before the, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, and even afterwards, I think the, uh, the, the relationship 
with the, of the West towards China uh, or with China will uh, will be uh, more uh, 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 important in the long run um, than uh, than the devastation in Europe uh, at the moment, and I, I I think we will be returning to that uh, um, in terms of trade policy sooner than later, um, uh, and and rather sooner than later because um, uh, the um, trade policy of 2021 uh, was uh, drawn also in in, in in China in mind, so. Uh, uh, there, I think uh, we are still looking from the EU perspective, uh, the possibilities of getting uh, China to uh, work as a constructive uh, player on, on in the multilateral trading system, which includes then, um, uh, you know, um, uh, having uh, more rule, uh, uh, rules uh, to, uh, to make sure that the uh, Chinese practices in, uh, in, in global trade uh, uh, do not distort competition in the same way as, as they have been doing uh, uh, in the past. And, and, and I think um, there will be the, uh, uh, the questions about the, uh, the US-China uh, strategic um, um, battle over um, technological uh, uh, supremacy uh, that will also uh, have an impact on, on how the EU perceives um, China relations. And um, while um, I would um, think that, uh, I mean, th there are valid security concerns that we need to address uh, in our relations with China, uh, I think at the same time, I think we have to um, look a bit more carefully as to what is valid security concerns. I mean, uh, and, and whether, uh, for instance, the US really needs to uh, place a 60, uh, I mean, Place sixty percent of Chinese exports um, um, in in the U United States under um, additional tariffs. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, it's uh, it doesn't seem like a long term solution. I think there has to be moderation in that regard as well. And so, uh, no, China will definitely be on our table uh, uh, in the years to come. And uh, and uh, but much in the short run depends on. Uh, what happens with the uh, in the Russian uh, Ukraine war yeah. and China's sure. position there? And maybe let me just follow up on that. What does this mean for the EU's relations with the US? Because we have obviously President Biden coming in town um, in Brussels. Um, this week we had a lot of um, echoes from both trade diplomats, but also officials on how um, Ukraine has brought the EU and the US more together, also in the context of the of the Trade and Tech Council. Um, so is this kind of a, a positive momentum now because of the sanctions, or do you think this ha will have uh, an impact really on the on the trade relations in the months or years um, ahead. I'm looking for your crystal ball to predict the future. Did you want to ask that question from me? Yes. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm certainly um, you know um, uh, hopeful that um, that the uh, the positive agenda that has been uh, brought um, by the uh, Trade and Technology Council will uh, will continue and produce. Um, tangible benefits for both parties. And I, I think um, it's also, um, from my perspective, sad that, um, uh, that we, have, we were not able to uh, conclude the TTIP uh, when it was there uh, uh, those years ago. And, uh, but uh, I, I fully understand that there are sensitivities uh, and, and uh, not everyone shares my view on that. Uh, um, the German... Uh, um, uh, Minister for Finance, I think he mentioned a couple of days back that he would want to see a comprehensive uh, trade agreement with uh, between the EU and the US. Uh, I I can't comment. I mean, I'm just a civil servant, so uh, I can't <laughs> comment on uh, on uh, whether uh, what is sensible and what is not. But uh, it's it's curious that I mean, given our proximity in terms of trade and investment, and 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 and, and the uh, the vast volumes that. Uh, that uh, across the Atlantic uh, each day, uh, it's it, it's uh, it's funny that we uh, we have this piecemeal approach to uh, relations, and I, I think it's uh, it's um, uh, I, I, it's it's definitely something that we have to look uh, more closely uh, in in in, mm -hmm. in in the coming months. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, just want to remind everyone that if you still have a question, don't hesitate. Um, these are um, the, your last chances to do so. I'll, um, I'll get back to David um, on both on, on China and, and the US because you've touched a little bit um, in your introductory remarks that this could provide some new momentum also for the Trade and Tech Council. Um, so happy to hear your thoughts on, on that, David. Yeah, very quickly because we are uh, we're, we're we're running out of time with China. Don't turn this into don't rush to turn this into Cold War two point naught. And I think Passy's right about you know the U the U S has been doing that. The, the level of integration is way beyond that of, uh, of 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 Russia. But on the other hand, governments and companies are clearly going to have to look at this whole resilience. And I, you know, I to an extent, what can governments do? Can they actually be able to say to companies, look, you know, what's your strategy in the, what's going to happen to this supply line in the event that there's a disruption in, in, in trade with China? I think it's going to be along, along those lines. There's going to have to be more collaboration. And then with the Trade and Technology Council, similarly. So I'm not one for uh, revitalizing TTIP, though I gave it three years of my, uh, my, my, my life. But more than what can we use the Trade and Technology Council to agree to find the things on which we agree and deepen those and also to bring in potentially other other countries. I think there was a mention earlier on standards. I don't seeing all the chat properly. But what can you know, what can we do in, 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 in those kind of in, in, in that field with friends, essentially, to, to deepen a, an, an agenda around standards and um, values and, and, and openness. Can we can we do something around that with the uh, with the US? And can we basically put to one side and just sort of ignore as embarrassments the sort of chlorinated chicken and all of that? Never mind, never mind that. We'll never agree on it. Let's just agree that we'll never agree on it. Put it to one side and deal with the, thing, with the things that we can, because suddenly we've got far bigger issues to to deal with. And as I, but as I say, I think it's going to be part of this new new form of corporatism. I'm afraid that was a dirty word for many years, in which companies and countries are going to be having those com those conversations and groups of countries and i think the track the trade and technology council fits within that kind of framework mm -hmm. thanks um i'd like to touch on one more subject um before before we wrap things up um your paper david um went into the the different business the different initiatives from the eu also on climate in uh, climate the, the green deal fit for 55 etc carbon border tax um, now with Ukraine, we see a need to quickly diversify away from, from Russia, potentially also from China. Um, will, will that have implications on lowering standards on climate, but potentially also on others, do you think? <laughs> There's, there's a really interesting question there. So I was, my, my biggest worry about the sustainability agenda was always that if there was an associated economic downturn and an economic cost with it. And uh, yeah, I've seen some work of my colleague, Jose Klimakiyama, with whom I wrote the paper, had also done some work on the cost of the Green Deal. There was a danger anyway that the Green Deal would become less, ac less acceptable. And I already hear from some member states, uh, you know, we, we're not, we're worried about this agenda. It doesn't seem to be, uh, to reflect our, our values. Now, what I think you may be able to get to now is a new impetus for the agenda, which actually addresses potentially some of the um, the, econo the economics as well and says, look, we need to make sure that the, the sustainability agenda is important, but it needs to deliver economically as well. And if we see a new urgency in developing the infrastructure around um, net, net, zero, net zero, reducing reducing emissions, that's actually the op an opportunity to um, um, essentially invest in uh -huh. an in you know a move away from oil and gas and a move into uh, su sustainable infrastructure because it's a huge investment that is required but that of course is going to bring us in turn back onto matters more of economic policy of eu financing so none of this is ever going to be easy but it does seem that you know we've got a new urgency now to actually We've got a political incentive even more than the, as much now as the, the climate incentive. We need urgency in moving away from oil, oil and gas. Yeah. But can we do it? I, I'm not sure. Big, big questions. I suspect slightly off all of all of our um, all of our expertise. But and and again, how do we do it in line? Carbon border adjustment mechanism needs to be done as a, on an international basis. I, ideally. On that occasion, I think it's right that the EU should put forward proposals, but I think it should be open to those that actually going global. Yeah. Patrick, what's your take? I saw you I saw you nodding. 
Yeah, well, I think from the conversations that, that I've been having with with stakeholders, both in, in Brussels, but also here in the UK, um, I think I think the point that David was making around the current crisis, accelerating the Fit for 55 and decarbonisation agendas is, is definitely there. But also coming back to the consumer point of view, um, we're seeing petrol prices reach uh, historical highs um in and, and really impacting consumers and that's driving people to start thinking a little bit more is an electric vehicle the right choice for me and they're they're, they're they're taking that rational economic choice to look at what's what vehicle is is best for them given given the fuel prices and that will uh, and it comes back to the point i was making earlier all of this transition needs to be driven by by the customers we can we can have mm-hmm. these huge um macro discussions but unless people are willing to go down to the dealership and buy an electric car it ain't going to happen um, but I think what we're seeing is is that increase in, in fuel prices is is driving people to start making that consideration. And we see that in some of the, the the statistics that are starting to come through in terms of registrations and and sales. Um just touching on, on, on carbon border as well that, that that was referenced. I think that that's a key piece to to get right. I think there is definitely a role for a carbon border adjustment mechanism, but it needs to be open, it needs to be global, and it can't be used simply as a tool to pick and choose which which products are allowed in and which aren't. And it needs to be developed in such a way that it, it works efficiently and isn't just more of a, a non-tariff barrier, more red tape that the importers have to deal with, but it's actually yeah. what, it's, what it's aimed to do. That's a debate that we'll be having in Brussels for the next couple of months on carbon border. Um, we look forward to it. Um, Pasi, just back to you on, on this link between trade and, and climate change and how the war in Ukraine might have, have changed that. What's, what's your thoughts? Well, uh... Just very quickly there, uh, I think um, um, I, David spoke of transformation and, and we are uh, going through a transformation in, uh, to a low carbon economy. I mean, regardless of um, the EU, regardless of CBAM and all that. Uh, and I think on, on for instance, on, on uh, with regard to raw materials, uh, there are possibilities in, um, in uh, making use of secondary raw materials, circular economy, um, um, in the European uh, perspective, uh, but um, uh, and I, I think I was reading um, during the weekend uh, from uh, just with, with regard to the uh, battery raw materials that uh, those will be completely um, different uh, materials in ten years' time in comparison to what sort of raw materials we will be using uh, in in batteries today. So uh, there will be a, a there are big uh, implications there in also uh, that the way we plan for um, trade policy or industrial policy that uh, that um, change will be with us uh, also in the years to come. And I think trade policy per se uh, needs to be a, an enabler of, uh, of the transition to the, uh, uh, to the next uh, economy. So, uh, and I think we should be mindful of the fact that uh, and, and, and that we can make uh, things happen with trade policy uh, also in the positive sense. So, uh, so it just depends on as to what we choose to do with it, right? Okay, and some might might seem to forget that once in a while. Um, great. I um, we could go forward obviously with this discussion, but I'm just very conscious of, of everyone's time, also the people that are tuning in. Um, so I'd like to wrap things up here. Um, thanks to all three of you for um, speaking about these different, very different subjects. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining and we hope to see you again back soon. Maybe David, if you want to have a final word as, a, as the host. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for uh, for moderating so expertly. And so, sorry, there's so much to discuss. I felt there were lots of things, comments flashing on the screen, which we could have discussed for another hour. But thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick and, uh, and, and Passy. And yes, hopefully we will return to also to in-person events very soon.